So Shatan Netwani is a final year PhD research student in Igneous Geochemistry and Economic Geology at the Imperial College and the Natural History Museum in London. His PhD research aims to understand the petrogenesis of magmas forming porphyry copper deposits using the chemistry of accessory mineral phases. And more recently, he has used machine learning techniques for mineral exploration. So over to you, Chetan. Um, thank you to All Deposits Hub um, for hosting today and organizing and for keeping everyone so well connected over the last couple of years. It's been really good to see what everyone's doing in the community. Um, so I've only got 10 minutes today, so I'm going to just try and show you more of an introduction to my work and then provide you some resources where you can read more um, if you're interested. So as, I, as, as um, Philip said, I'm going to be talking about some of the work I've done in my PhD, which is using machine learning algorithms to classify uh, porphyry copper fertility in arc magmas. Um, so just to quickly introduce this concept of, um, some of you might be familiar with it, but uh, it's been noted by many people that magmas associated with porphyry copper deposits have a characteristic coral geochemistry, such as having a high strontium yttrium ratio or a high lanthanum ytterbium ratio. And um, many have interpreted this to reflect how these magmas have evolved in the crust, potentially hydrous magma evolution at high pressures in the deep crust. And under these conditions, we stabilize minerals like amphibol and organet, and we suppress plagioclase. And this leads to derivative mag melts with um, the chemistry I just, I just noted. Um, and these plots here are um, from Bob Lauk's 2014. I've sort of adapted them and put on some data from the literature. And what you can see is that um, porphyry copper rocks have a higher strontium yttrium ratio and a higher aluminium titanium ratio relative to unfertile igneous rocks. But one thing, so this is useful for mineral exploration. However, one thing you might notice is that there are a large number of sort of misclassifications. If you see this red line that I've drawn on here, um, is that there are a large number of false positives, which can be problematic for mineral exploration. And this is where machine learning can come into this is trying to minimize like false positives in misclassifications. Um, so just to introduce this concept of supervised machine learning. So this is where we have data sets um, such as a whole rock geochemistry data set with labels. And we're trying to use the whole rock geochemistry data set to predict those labels. So in this instance, we have all this whole rock geochemistry, all these elements and each data point is labeled, whether it's from a porphyry copper deposit or whether it's not from a porphyry copper deposit. And we're trying to make predictions and train a model to do that. And supervised learning has sort of a few different um, advantages over sort of conventional bivariate classification schemes. And I've got a couple here. Um, one of the things I really like about them and which is most one of the most useful things is they can use nonlinear classification boundaries and sort of capture complex relationships between data points. Um, and in this, in this image here, what I've got is, um, this is from the documentation of scikit-learn, which is um, a Python uh, data science package. And you can see um, three fictitious data sets with a blue and a red class. And you can see how many different algorithms attempt to classify this data. Um, and what I've highlighted in, in the red is a linear model, um, which might be what you might conventionally sort of draw yourself. Um, using uh, y equals mx plus c. And you can see that it's not able to capture some of these relationships very well. In the bottom right-hand corner, you've got the accuracy and you can see that these might not perform very well. However, if you use some more sophisticated machine learning algorithms, you're able to capture these relationships. You can see, for example, this um, non-linear support vector machine here. Um, you can see that the accuracy jumps up quite a lot. And you can see this uh, going across all these machine learning algorithms can nicely capture this relationship. Another advantage of machine learning classifiers is they can take advantage of the high dimension space. So remember when, we, when we, we're collecting geochemical data, we often have a whole load of elements and using a, a plot like the one we have here, you're only sort of utilizing uh, a few of them when in reality you have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, which um, you could potentially make a better classification plane in that high dimension space, which sort of incorporates more of the variance of your data set. So that's, that's the reason for this sort of approach. So just some very quickly, some methodology for what I've done, just collected data from the literature and from the GROC data database and labeled anything as fertile 
associated with a porphyry deposit sort of objectively if it occurs within two million years of a mineralization episode in a, in a mineralization center and did that using geochronology and that's because we want these labels to be as objective as possible it's obviously not perfect but that's one approach and then there are a series of pre-processing steps um this is sort of a non-exhaustive list list of things that i've done so sort of screening for hydrothermal alteration um sort of trying to restore class balance to the data sets because class imbalance can um, be a bit de detrimental in some cases uh, applying the center log ratio transformation which um, accounts for the closure effect of geochemical data and then performing dimensionality reduction to reduce the high number of dimensions we have into a smaller number of dimensions to sort of capture more of the uh, covariance of our data, data set and then applied for machine learning algorithms. I've got these here, logistic regression, support vector machine, neural network and random forest. I won't go into the theory in any detail because we don't really have time. And uh, most of the work that I've done has been uh, using Python in uh, this package called scikit-learn, uh, as well as some other stuff, which I'm, um, but, but I'm sure the other speakers will sort of give other approaches as well to tackling these problems. And I've tried to upload some coding examples to my github page so if you are interested you can have a look um, it's pretty primitive at the moment so um, i can try updating that in future if anyone's got any requests or they want more so just just to briefly show you this so what we, what we did then was we tested these models or validated them using what we call a tenfold cross validation where we split up our training database into 10 uh 10 folds 10 segments and we validate the model by using the nine folds to train the model and then the one remaining fold to validate and test the performance and then we repeat this nine more times until each fold has appeared in the validation test set. And you can see here some of the metrics that we get and I just want to highlight if you compare sort of the machine learning classifiers to sort of just classifying based on strontiometrium greater than 35, you can see how we can get a higher accuracy by about 10, 20%. And we can decrease the false positive rate quite considerably by about 20%. And that's where sort of the application is or the useful application is. You can see the true positive rate stays more or less the same. It's more the false positive rate that's changing. And also for another comparison, I've got this plot here from Ahmed et al 2019, the strontium manganese strontiometrium plot. And you can see that the machine learning classifiers can um, improve on that as well. So one of the arguments people always have against machine learning is that it's quite black box and you don't actually know what's going on in the inside. You know, you just give your you sort of junk in, junk out sort of thing. Um, and what's becoming more popular is explainability libraries to try and explain your machine learning model. Um, so I've just got an example here of uh, one approach that I've taken. This is called um, uh, shapely values, and this is based on game theory. So it's bas basically where we retrain our models lots and lots of times, but with different iterations of elements present in the model. And what we do is we compare the model performance when a, an element is present to compare to um, when it's not present, and we sort of see what the deviation in model performance is. And what I've got here on these graphs is bar charts is the feature importance for different elements for each, each of these four models. And you can begin to pick out some sort of geological meaning to these things. So, for example, um, it showed me that low manganese and low concentrations of the middle rare earth elements is important. And this is related, I think, to amphibole uh, fractionation. Um, other elements like aluminium and strontium are important, and these are compatible in plagioclase. So that's um, another mineralogical control. And then some more fluid mobile elements come up in like potassium, which could be related to hydrothermal alteration. So we aren't completely able to exclude that, I don't think. Um, so overall, this is sort of validating the hypothesis that people have thought before that porphyry magma has evolved deep in the crust. And, um, you know, like, for example, manganese, I didn't really think in the past that was such an important element, but it's drawn my eye to it a bit more now. And so that's something that machine learning might be able to help you with. Um, so I think this is useful. Um, so anyway, I'm uh, running out of time. And um, here are just some concluding remarks to leave you with in the cartoon. Um, and thank you um, to the various co-authors co who've helped um, with all this work. And we've got a full paper available in Mineralium Depositor, which you can have a read. And I sort of go into a, a lot more detail on some of the theory behind all of this. And there's a lot more figures for you to have a look at. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, so hopefully that was of use and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chatham.
this is a really nice presentation. Uh, we will back quickly to uh, Francisca. Okay, so Francisca holds a PhD from Laurentian University focused on mineral perspectivity mapping within hydrothermal systems. And she has a strong geoscience background with over five years of specialization in data science and machine learning for exploration targeting in magmatic and hydrothermal mineral systems. She has experience processing and integrating multiple geoscience data sets, including geophysical and satellite remote sensing data to map mineral exploration vectors and mineral system signatures. So, uh, Francisca, the floor is yours. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot to All Deposits Hub for the invite. Uh, I'm going to share work that I did during my PhD at Laurentian University under the supervision of Professor Richard Smith. And the work was uh, on mineral exploration targeting in the ABTB gold belt. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, so it's on mineral prospectivity mapping. Uh, just a brief overview. It is a prospectivity mapping is a method that evaluates how prospective an area is for exploration uh, by spatially viewing multiple geoscience data sets um, and uh, using machine learning to recognize correlations between each geoscience layer with uh, existing mines. So the idea is to get to here where you uh, develop a prospectivity map that has, that has probability scores that range between zero and one, with one being highly prospective and zero being not very prospective. So this is from um, a paper published in Audio, Audio Geology Reviews. So I'm gonna, in the next couple of slides, just show how we got to that. The work particularly is in the ABTB Greenstone Belt, um, which borders the, it straddles the borders between Ontario and Quebec in Eastern Canada. Uh, the Abbey TV uh, is the largest and best preserved New York greenstone belt in the world. And the work specifically is in the Swayze greenstone belt, which is found here. And it's known as the ex Southwestern extension of the Abbey TV. Um, there's been numerous geological studies and geochronological studies that ties the Abbey TV to uh, the Swayze to the rest of the Abbey TV. Um, so, yeah, so in prospectivity mapping, as uh, shown in the first slide, it's an integration of multiple geoscience data sets. Um, so for example, here we have a total magnetic intensity map to help us map uh, faults and structures. Um, and then uh, this is an upward continuation of that map, which helps us map um, intr intrusive bodies at depth. Uh, D2, D3 high strain zones, which are known as the fluid pathways that transported um, fluids throughout the, the greenstone belt, fault intensity sections, um, EM conductivity maps, um, lithological contacts. So any geoscience data sets that you can put together and run through a machine learning model. In this example here, it's, uh, we ran the data through a radial basis function neural network to get out a uh, mineral prospectivity map. And you can see over here, the values range from very low to very high prospectivity. And after you get the data out, you put it back into GIS and you can uh, essentially established targets or regions that you think of would be prospective to look at. So um, the next slide, it's uh, the data overlaying with the geology and some of the important features we thought which uh, should be looked at more closely. Um, and as Chetan mentioned in the previous slide with machine learning models, you'll be, you, you're able to derive important features. So to recognize or see what um, the model itself found what found as important in mapping prospectivity at a, at a certain area. So if you can see here, we have, this is the radial basis function model and support vector machines. Um, the comparison is that you can see which layers were seen as very important in mapping prospectivity in that area. And you see faulting and EM, um, a DK constant maps, all these different data sets, you see what, uh, essentially uh, built up to define as some of these red areas as prospective. And then you can also get your uh, the scores or the performances of your model just to see how well it performs with the receiver operator curve. So just to zoom in to one of the targets that were selected in the study, uh, it's over here, not too far from the Stuhlberg mine. Um, this area specifically was selected because um, a lot of different factors were correlating with one another. For example, it was not too far from the D2 high strain zones. 
that are known to be um, prospective or the, the main fluid pathway, this high EM conductivity and magnetic worms. Um, the, the, the prospective area correlates with um, lithologies that would represent high rheological contrast or contacting lithologies, which is a good area for, um, for fluid flow. And then uh, it also is close to third and second and third order um, fault zones as well. So every, every, um, every feature that can be mapped um, in a mineral system is put together with, through these machine learning models to derive prospectivity mapping, prospectivity maps. And then later on, you can go in and see if there's more data to collect in that area or put a drill hole there and see what happens next. Uh, so <laughs> the problem with traditional machine learning for mineral exploration targeting is that you need enough known locations of mines to train and make predictions. Uh, so you need enough predictor layers and you need enough targets, right, to run it through all of that and some of the questions I've gotten and I've also asked is how can we use machine learning in a greenfield environment with limited deposit data? And also how can we use pre-trained models in mineral exploration targeting, uh, right? Pre-trained models have been developed by numerous entities, uh, Facebook, uh, Google, and uh, they can be used and, uh, and applied in different parts uh, of, of science, right? But uh, we haven't really had that happen in mineral exploration targeting. And the idea is to use transfer learning for an area. So using an area where there's enough predictor layers and enough prospects, run that data through a deep learning model and then save those weights and parameters and use those weights to um, make predictions on a new area that probably that doesn't have enough mines and prospects. Um, but these two areas should have a similar mineral system or mineral deposit that you're targeting. You're just using the, no the knowledge learned from the first region to make exploration, um, to create a new target regions and to create a prospectivity map. Uh, so this was done in the ABTV again, but in the Swayze as well as the Matheson, these are part of the ABTV Greenstone Belt. Uh, the Swayze was used as a source domain. So essentially the area that we're learning from and then the Matheson, which is east of Timmins, was used as a target domain, so the area that we're predicting on. The two areas, um, geology is similar, except for that the Matheson has a thick layer of glacier lycrostine till, uh, which um, makes uh, expl exploring that area a bit difficult. But um, yeah, so we ran some predictor layers from the Swayze um, through a deep learning model. And some of the parameters used were like K-fold and uh, batch normalization that I won't get into, but essentially we ran that, we trained the model on data sets from the Swayze and then recreated the same data sets on the, math, on the Matheson, right? So there are two requirements essentially is to make sure that the data from the source domain um, is similar or translatable to the target domain. So if you're using faults and geophysics and geochemistry to map prospectivity from one area to the other, you should be able to be to translate that information onto the next area so that your model is able to make the right predictions for prospectivity in the second area. So that's what we did. And uh, this is the results that we get. So again, you see a prospectivity map of the Matheson with uh, values ranging from very low to high prospectivity and the highly prospective regions are seen in red. Um, we also derived a future importance estimation uh, uh, from, the deep, from the deep learning model, as well as random forest, mostly to just see how the two models compare in terms of um, using same sitting data sets are important for mapping prospectivity in that area. And you see our receiver operator curve, the mean accuracy is uh, about zero, about 80% and uh, the, the model itself was able to predict 68% of unseen deposits in the Matheson. So we're able to train a model in one area and let it understand the parameters of gold mineralization in that area and use that information onto a completely new area, which is similar in geology. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what we got. Uh, so key takeaways from this talk is that uh, machine learning models are becoming increasingly useful and applicable in mineral exploration targeting. Um, but machine learning uh, brownfield exploration sites 
benefit the most from machine learning because you need enough data to train a model and to get a suitable model. So usually when you create a prospectivity map for any location, you usually have to have enough um, training data or locations of mines, unless if you're using a knowledge-driven approach, not a data-driven machine learning approach. Um, but we also see that uh, transfer learning and deep neural network can help us um, transfer information from one region to the next when you're trying to create a prospectivity map. Um, and then we also see that transfer learning can help your scientists in harvesting data from very well explored regions to make prospectivity predictions in new areas that may not have target data set. Um, yeah, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francisca. Now we'll go quickly to Sean. So Sean holds a Bachelor of Science, Master of Science and PhD degrees in geology. He has over 17 years of global experience and is currently the Chief Technology Officer for Gold Spot Discoveries, a technology company that creates and applies artificial intelligence, data science, and field data collection methods to discover mineralization more quickly, efficiently, and at a reduced cost. So Sean, over to you. All right, well, <clears throat> um, I think that, uh, you know, Chetan and Francisca's uh, talks were such great examples of different AI tools that we have in the AI toolbox. And why I'm especially, um, you know, interested in those two subjects is that it really reflects how there's a variety of different things that we use in exploration to go searching for deposits. And actually, people are only waking up to this uh, very gradually in our industry. So at one time, people thought it was all about regional prospectivity maps like Francesca was showing, but it's so much more than that. I mean, we can look at different minerals, different data types in different ways. So um, I'm going to step like way, way into a bigger picture and uh, uh, talk more about uh, like, where did we, um, how did we get to this position and how did the history lead us here and then sort of where we're going in the application of these, these sort of AI methods for exploration. So um, I, work, I work for Goldspot, as, um, as it was introduced. And really what this is, is a technology company that looks to explore more quickly and efficiently using technology. And one of the things that people think about when you're talking about AI-driven exploration is, you know, the prospectivity analysis map. You are taking different layers of information that are useful to a geologist, you're stacking them up, and then you're looking for a pattern or coincidence or correlation or covariance across those data layers that tells you something about where to go exploring. And that's based on your expertise as a, as a geologist. And exploration is really just one part of a bigger life cycle that we call the mining value chain. So the, the subject of the talk is about AI value chains and machine learning, uh, sorry, AI value chains and mining value chains and sort of how these relate together. And so stepping through from the exploration side, I would say we're all familiar with the mining value chain and the idea that exploration happens at different stages. As Francisca mentioned, in greenfield stages, we might have a little bit of data. In uh, brownfield stages, we might have a lot of data. But how does that relate to AI and the tools that we, that we select? And you know, where are we getting better with using the data and using the tools in more effective matters? So if we think about just big data and then try to go from there into why we're using AI at all, I think we can strip machine learning techniques uh, way back to a few basic ideas. And really what we're talking about is an enabling technology. So there are so many ways that we can measure the earth, scan rocks, uh, take quantifications and in our attempt to find an ore deposit. So our education and our training and our experience help us to select which of these tools that we'll use in any given case. Uh, for people who are geophysicists, you know, they're going to grav gravitate toward geophysical techniques. For people in geochemistry, they're going to gravitate towards geochemical techniques. But in reality, the signal of ore deposits it may be contained across many different data types, which are interesting to many different disciplines. So how can we better integrate these data and, and make more effective you know, exploration decisions. The question is, is AI a good enabling technology? You know, we just saw a couple examples of, of how it is, but 
people really speak about this as if it's a, a new and unproven thing. So is it really new and unproven? If you go to the literature, you may be surprised to find out that the first successful deposit discovery using AI is from 1978, and that this was in Washington, USA. So the approaches and the technology that were used for this molybdenum porphyry discovery are really truly AI. It, it was a Bayesian prior probability statistics uh, computed by you know, computers and including systems which progressively processed geological layers. It is, it is exactly the same as the sorts of prospectivity maps that we make now. The only difference was that the computers were a little less efficient. So I'm really amazed at, at an example like this because you know, we're having uh, ore deposit hub uh, conversations now. We've got papers coming out in the Journal of the uh, Society of Economic Geologists. And it's really a conversation of, oh, should we trust this technology? But this is actually pretty old stuff. I mean, this discovery in 1980 is followed up 10 years later by uh, review papers by the Geological Survey of Canada, which summarize a whole swath of AI techniques used for exploration. So even at that time, uh, people were looking at the subject matter as developed enough that they could be writing review papers, not just sort of testing things as they went along. So it seems that these approaches aren't new and they have merit and yet they are new to us. So why is that? You know, is there like a big conspiracy against AI? I don't think so. I think in my opinion, that the real reason we're living in this age of, of artificial intelligence exploration uh, relates to the cost of computation. So if you look at this chart, this is a chart of different mathematical innovations that relate to the development of AI over time, beginning around the year 1800 and then extending towards 2020. So I'll draw your attention to the uh, right hand gold box. You can see the number three cents US. So that's the cost in the year 2019 to compute a gigaflop of computer processing. And then if you follow that black curve upwards to the gold box at the top, um, that around the year 1960, just after the word machine learning is invented, computing the same gigaflop is no longer three cents. At that time, it was $160 trillion. So this cost change over time alone is enough to explain why AI and machine learning adoption haven't been more widespread. And it helps us to understand why we're just entering the true potential of this technique, because many of the ground um, breaking innovations were made at a time when only scientists had access to strong computing power. So if we go back to our big diagram of data and enabling technologies, we can plot the first discovery success I mentioned, 1978, down there at the bottom. And we know that at that time, computers are basically terrible. They're very expensive and people don't have access to them. But if we start to follow along the bottom, we can think about a few other milestones. In the year 1990, we have weights of evidence. Again, prior probability, Bayesian statistics. People are starting to um, become interested in the idea that we can integrate these different layers together. Then, you know, around the year 2000, there's another bump, but that's because mobile PC computing and internet are now becoming more popular and it sort of drops off again. And then around the year 2010, we have people like John Carranza doing really amazing work using the random forests algorithm to make prospectivity maps. And that's when it begins to grab people's attention. Then in the year 2016, we have things like hackathons with publicly accessible mining data. And at that point is when it really starts to, to take off. So one other interesting point of this diagram is that those boxes, the width of them represents the time that the um, technology was invented. And the right-hand side of the box basically represents when that technology became mature and commonly used in exploration. And you'll see that as an enabling technology, AI is just just a loser because it it's taken it absolutely ages to get to where it needs to go. But I do think that we're now living in this world where we all have the access and ability to use AI and the AI value chain in the mining value chain. So the things that changed really were, we now have more effective ways to extract data. We have ways to compute it more effectively. Those are like the CPU and GPU approaches as well as cloud computing. The cost of data storage has dropped 
dramatically down from, you know, I bought a 10 megabyte hard drive 20 years ago for $300. And now I can buy something with six orders of magnitude more storage. Um, we have a proliferation of information and literature. And then of course, most importantly, the industry has now become uh, accepting of this. So now I'm gonna shift, now that you have sort of this context of, you know, why AI now, let's talk about what comes next. So since about 2016, we've seen the ability for people to get uh, machine learning algorithms to develop their own uh, scripts and approaches get data as it needs to be in the form it needs to be, because a lot of the data wasn't collected with the intent that you would use it for machine learning purposes. Now we're starting to think in that context. So I think what we're seeing now is a transition from something that I think of as like prototype machine learning or, or like, you know, amateur, not in a bad way, but amateur in the sense that we're self-taught a lot of the time. We're transitioning into like production scalable AI, which is something you would see at companies like Microsoft, Amazon. In the early days, we were producing a lot of case studies and proofs of concept just to get buy-in from the industry because people didn't really trust this stuff. It was really good for one-off solutions, but it is bad for industry standards. Now on the right-hand side, we have more the production level uh, style. These are you know, what groups like Netflix would use, um, Tesla, you, know, you name it. This is not work done by geologists. This is done by computer scientists, engineers who are trained in this subject. So I think that we're, we're gradually starting to need to guarantee to people uh, data access, data form, data organization, uh, server and processing uptime, and the ability to generate results really consistently and as geologists, because most of us are main experts in geology, you know, we don't have that background. So this is where AI value chains are coming in and they're coming to us from other disciplines like computer science and engineering. Um, a very simple AI value chain looks like this. Basically uh, what you're seeing here is a flow of data that we could translate to any discipline, not just geology. It starts with the data collection and the idea that data needs to be organized into like a pool or a data lake or databases in some kind of organized, usually tabular uh, manner. Then you have what's changing now, model generation. So I think, you know, all of us in the phone call or the, the Zoom call are, uh, are geologists. We're developing models because we have a concept of the geological importance of them. And then we're organizing the data and creating them with uh, prior knowledge of, of how they can be important to help us explore. Computer scientists have none of that. What they do have are two kinds of training, uh, DevOps and MLOps or AI ops. And when they say ops, they mean just you know, software development and operations. Those uh, groups write code very differently than geologists do. And the real purpose of this is to get your data sets organized, to have data coming in, to be uh, training data models and, and machine learning models in a way where there's constant training, not just a big data set and then a model and then you use it. It's like uh, flowing in, being validated, being tested against older versions, rolling out to some people, being tested. You know, it's a whole system that we're not really even aware of. And then as it kind of flows back to us as geologists, we have the ongoing data collection as we generate more and more information. And we start to expect that results are coming from those automated models. So just finish up with two, two quick slides. The AI value chain is only interesting and important to us because it's going to allow us to do things like Francisca and Chetan showed us, but more quickly and in a more organized way than for example, going to download all the GeoRock data and then processing it and then making a model, you know, we, we're gonna start to have a lot more flow into the future. Um, I think as geologists, I would encourage everybody to think about this, this change because it is going to influence how you collect data in industry. For those of you who are at mines, you know, it is, it is just a exercise in patience to try to make sure that data is collected in the same way consistently between crews year over year and between deposits. But we will have to go there. We also need to start thinking about different things that maybe we won't take care of, but we need to start hiring teams to do this, like data security and data management. Often companies only have like a single database manager. 
And then we're going to start looking at different ways that AI is integrated in our work, you know, whether it's on a hardware software basis, whether it's a one off prototype, like I mentioned, or whether it's like a full industry scalable thing. But where we only really truly care about all that other stuff is where it gets us. And those are the AI use cases, which could be things like geology interpretation, prospectivity, and you name it. But it also has to do with things like digital twins, safety planning, the robotics underground, and, and other things like that. So I'm going to end on this slide, which hopefully um, spurs a little bit of conversation and debate in the discussion period. Sorry to have gone over my time a little bit. I think the, the fundamental point I wanted to make today was we all know that machine learning tools can add value. We all know that we can integrate data more effectively. And you've seen two presentations today that did exactly that. And now the question is, how do we move forward to take those ideas from um, something that only a specialist can use to something that any geologist can use? Okay, yeah. thank you so much, Sean. <laughs> it's not a problem. Actually, I have to say that uh, uh, yeah, the first part of your talk, I learned a lot because I was not aware that the first uh, using of this kind of technology, I would say. Um, it's so back in time. Actually, Ancient. I was, uh, now we are moving to the, to the discussion time. Um, you can drop your questions on the chat. Before that, I will go to the speakers and ask if uh, any of you uh, have uh, some question to each other. So, uh, Sean, Francisca, or Chetan, do you have any questions for each other? If not, I have some for you. I've got one for Chetan, if that's okay. okay. Yeah, that's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. It, it's a, it, it was a really cool talk, and uh, it made me um, curious about something that you may have an opinion on. You know, you're looking at whole rock geochemistry and finding that signal of the magma fractionation with the relevance that, you know, the, the, the Pluton was fertile, so it was wet. And, you know, um, I was curious if, it, like in whole rock chemistry, you're really looking at the aggregate chemistry of a bunch of minerals. Do you have a sense that uh, the future is in mineral chemistry or enhancing whole rock uh, analyses to, to sort of look at porphyry fertility? Um, I think, I think that, that, I think they're both useful, but for a variety of different cases. For example, so whole rock geochemistry will sort of give you obviously that bulk signature, which can be useful, but that can also be limited in some ways because you know your rock might be altered or you know you might not even have rocks in the first place. You might actually instead only have detrital materials to look at, in which case your indicator minerals might be more important. Um, so, so sort of my opinion is that both, both components are useful, but in different cases. And they can also tell you different components of information as well. So the whole rock geochemistry might give you sort of a composite of the magma fractionation and maybe even some shallow crustal processes and some hydrothermal alteration as well. Whereas in the mineral chemistry, um, that can tell you about maybe even something specific. Maybe the zircon chemistry might tell you about the sort of fractionation or maybe even oxidation states or something, or even the geochronology, which was also important. Um, so I think they're, they're telling you different things. And I think there are, I think sort of both need to be in our minds going, going forwards, I think. I remember Scott Halley telling me once that unless you can sample by the bucket, the exploration industry doesn't want it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's a really good point. Um, I have a question for Francesca, actually. Yeah, go ahead. Um, this is I good. really enjoyed your talk. I particularly enjoyed the... Um, transfer learning going from uh, brownfield sites to greenfield sites. Um, I wondered if you could give us an idea, also thinking about Sean's talk about the volume of everything, how many sort of trainable parameters that sort of model would have and are you able to train it on a CPU or do you require like a graphics processing unit? Um, so essentially your data is, um, it's just, it's a map of pixels, right? And regardless of how you add you input it into a Python environment, it's going to be converted to an umpire array. So I wasn't using like a CNN, it was just a deep, a regular deep learning method. Uh, in terms of parameters for training the model, it's all about hyperparameter tuning because I was looking at them 
the different models I created. And some would have uh, maybe three dense layers with maybe 50 neurons and others will have a lot more than that. Um, and then it's also a matter of how many time you take, how, many, how, much, how long it takes to iterate through the process. So if uh, training a model, um, I guess if you put in the failure time, it would take maybe a week or two, but in terms of just seeing how fast it runs, it could be a couple minutes. Then you see how your training uh, accuracies and losses look like, and then go back, maybe change your predict layers and see how to represent maybe your geophysics data. Maybe you should just have um, low magnetic anomalies instead of just the entire geophysical map. So <laughs> it's such a, it's a difficult question to answer when it comes to how long the model really trains in the parameters because it's very data specific, but it also takes you back to the pre-processing and exploratory data analysis and making sure that everything is set in correctly before, and then run it through and then, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And probably following the, the year answer, uh, Francisca, and I'm yeah. not uh, quite uh, an expert on this topic, but one of my question is when you train your model, you show that you have a different percentage of importance of each, uh, I would say, faults, hydrothermal alteration, something, different features. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, different features, so, yeah. Okay, do you give a percentage of importance for each feature? It's you that decide, it's the model? Yeah, it's the model. Yeah, so it's, it's completely data-driven. So the model okay. itself, it depends on what model you're looking at. So each model, like a random forest mm -hmm. and the approach that I use with uh, radial base, with the neural network, they all uh, uh, derive features, importances in different ways. Uh, for example, with the neural network, it was a variance-based feature importances, but essentially the model is able to see which, which layers or features okay. have the best correlation with the distributions of deposits, and then we'll give you a score at the end of running the whole thing. So you get a data-driven answer to what's more important during prospectivity mapping for those layers you've put in. And you could okay. also go back and, as a geologist, figure out why it, it's considered this layer important. And usually it, it makes sense. <laughs> and if it doesn't, you probably can just go back and see why. Okay, that's great, that's great. Yeah, this is really interesting. Now, I will get back to the chat because we have a lot of questions dropping in. So I will back to Marta. Marta, can you check the questions, please? Yes, of course. So I'll start with Sonu Kumar, who is asking, I guess this is a general question for the three of you. So for mineral exploration, which one is better, better supervised or unsupervised ML? Um, so if you have locations of already known deposit distributions, you would use a supervised machine learning approach because you're essentially telling the model that this is where our deposits are and this is where there are no deposits and use the two information to figure out where a new area that could be prospective. Um, yeah, so supervised. And then if you don't have any, any deposits, you could use like a, um, a knowledge-driven approach, which like fuzzy logic, where you're giving the model, you're, you're essentially telling it what's important and how far away everything is. And then it's a combination um, approach to prospectivity mapping. Another interesting type of machine learning I guess is self-supervised learning which is what people are more broadly in the sort of AI industry not related to mineral exploration particularly but that's the direction people are wanting to go in when you think about self-driving cars and things like that because self-supervised learning is more similar to how humans learn so this is sort of where your data has like pseudo labels uh, I'm trying to think of a relevant um, example let's say you have some pictures of core from some deposit and someone had logged that core and written descriptions, then maybe the descriptions could be used as sort of pseudo labels of that of those core images. And you could then potentially use that to help you train up a model um, to predict things from core images, for example. Um, so I think that's sort of a quite an exciting area where people are working in, which would be exciting to see over the next decade or so. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that, um, you know, you can ask this, 
to, to use a different example, you know, what's, be, what's a better measure of average, median or mean? Depends. What's better for exploration, uh, IP or airborne magnetics? Totally depends. The machine learning world is a zoo of techniques and there are like hundreds of thousands of algorithms, which many of which are, are flavors of like other core styles. So there is no, there is no best algorithm that period. And then um, that's why I guess it remains to be seen what the best education system is going to be to help people to understand this better, whether we have, um, you know, machine learning training in, in third year university undergraduate programs, or whether people train as geologists and then do a master's that involves machine learning. You know, it's, it's something that's, I think, uh, pretty actively being debated in the academic community. But um, also, you know, obviously sessions like this is, is, is like a major source of education across across our community because um, many people would never have the exposure or familiarity to, to even know that difference without picking up like an AI textbook. But it's the same in all disciplines, you know, manufacturing, uh, insurance analysis or whatever, geology too. They're all trying to figure out what's the best approach fit for purpose. Yeah, and to add on to what you just said, Sean, it also depends on whether you have a classification problem or a regression problem. And that's where you start figuring out which machine learning or like, yeah, machine learning algorithm to use for that problem that you have. Thank you. So we are moving to, we have a lot of questions. I will pick here one from Matt Dunlop because it's a question that I have too and I would like to hear your opinion. Matt, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question please? Sure, thanks. Thank you. Um, so. I, I, I kind of look at some of our mine sites and we have some mines that, you know, maybe started mining in the early 1900s or late 1800s even. I look through our databases and there may be, you know, even three or four or five different types of copper assays that we've had over the decades. Um, and even, you know, geochemistry, sometimes you might say like chromium by multi-acid digest is going to give you a different answer than chromium by lithium borate fusion. So we've got all these different types of historical data and data types and how do you how do you resolve that in a machine learning model where you know one number might be more reliable than the other or the data kind of looks the same because it's still a copper number or a chromium number or whatever but the but the data was generated in a different way or many many years ago burn it all matt just burn it all and start again <laughs> I've, I've had that thought <laughs> I heard uh, somebody from Anglo at uh, Gordon Research Conference a few years ago said something like that. You know, we've got these containers full of data and I'm just going to throw it all out. Um, I, uh, I work a lot with geochemical data and it's a real pain because of those changes. And also, you know, like same laboratory, two different years can give you completely different populations of information and like the spurious uh, correlation in the machine learning models is brutal. And I think that's why, you know, like every, every time anybody ever talks about machine learning and geology these days, they talk about domain expertise and the need to have domain specialization because a geochemist would instantly gravitate to that. Even, you know, incorrect uh, floor values, like for less than detection, you know, um, substituted values that have been put in to take care of blanks, um, all that type of stuff, you know, you need some exposure to the data to know what's appropriate. And so coming back to your question, there's, there's a couple of different interesting things I've seen. One of which is um, if you have sufficient overlap between two data sets where you can then train a model, which basically corrects one to the other, that's a neat, that's a neat way to do it. So for example, you have um, like an aquaregia digest that doesn't totally digest everything. And therefore, you know, you don't have your silicate chemistry represented well. And then you have like a, a full, a full digest method of a four acid. And then people will, will try to relate those together or, you know, full acid digest to a PXRF data set or something like that. That's pretty neat. And then the other way, if you're really desperate and you have enough samples, I mean, you can do things like just a Z score, normalize everything, which shifts the populations so that the mean becomes zero and the spread of the data is, is like related to standard deviation. That of course only works if you've sampled the same geological population so that the mean actually means the same thing. But if you took mine A and mine B and did that, it would, it would be meaningless. 
So I guess it's one way to say that, um, like, again, it's, it's what's the geological condition? What does your data contain? What are you trying to do? And then, and then you sort of have to work backwards from there. Got it. Thanks. All right. So uh, we could going with the questions. So there's a question from Chanel. She, uh, Chanel says, thank you uh, for your great presentations. And how does the future, future application of machine learning look like for the exploration of secondary mineral resources like mine tailings? Um, I, it's awesome. It's great, right? Because everything, so often there are signals of economic mineralogy, right? like, like ore, ore grade um, deposits captured in old data sets that we didn't realize. And I, I mean, like a couple that come to mind are, I saw a great thing in Western Australia, finding vanadium mineralization in a bunch of old nickel gold tailings. And it was because somebody just went data mining. So, you know, it's kind of more to the natural language processing end of AI, uh, looking for certain keywords and minerals that related to vanadium as neat. Uh, another one would be uh, using AI more from like automated processing. Um, I've seen this in, in old uranium districts in Ontario, looking for critical elements like held in, in resistate silicates and stuff like cesium and things like this. So I think it's as, it's as broad, the opportunity is as broad as your imagination. It's just a case of figuring out how people didn't look for something before and then being the one to, to choose a tool from the toolbox and use it. We have a question here for Francisca from Loyal Aries. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, uh, thanks. Thank you. Hey, Francisca, I liked uh, your talk, found it interesting. Uh, I was just curious, however, on you know, how did you just choose to decide to, you know, to use certain uh, geophysical data sets and the processing of those data sets? And especially, I just uh, saw one of your slides, you had the first vertical derivative of upward continued aeromagnetic data. And so I was just really wondering with some of these uh, slightly different uh, treatments, uh, why were they chosen? Uh, yeah, uh, it's been a lot of trial and error sometimes, but um, so for example, for the upper continued geophysics layer, um, it was a matter of trying to see uh, deeper. So we had the, uh, to the RTP magnetic data set and wanted to see signatures of the mag data at a, at a certain, at different depths, right? Because um, the idea was to follow a mineral systems approach and try to understand and see if we can see different features like the source, the transport and the trap sections of the mineral system. And geophysics data, especially AeroMag is very useful in uh, recognizing uh, path, fluid pathways. And for that upward continuation specifically, uh, there was research published that showed that um, the, the gradient, um, the like gravity gradients are good for uh, pathway uh, regions. So yeah, we went ahead and decided to get the upper continued map for up to two kilometers for the MAD data set and then looked at how it's specially correlated with already existing mineral deposits in that area. And that's how uh, that data set became important because we, no we noticed that most of these deposits lie around the mag um, upper continued to two kilometers. So at, at that depth around the, the rims of that data, uh, uh, another publication called it magnetic worms, essentially, and gravity gravity worms or gravity gradients were also really good for targeting. So that, that's how we, uh, we, we, we came across that. Uh, same thing with the EM data set. It was, uh, there was an EM data set and then an apparent decay constant that was calculated from the EM data. And just looking at the data and um, looking at the special co association or co correlation with mineral deposit distributions. Um, yeah, we saw uh, conductive features and especially correlates with mineral deposits. This probably is a really good data set to use for targeting. It also correlated with a lot of um, other lithologies like Benedi formations. So we started thinking about rheological contrast and um, how that's, you know, helping us see features that are part of the mineral system, like the trap site. So that's how we all, we got to that. It was just a lot of trial and error, looking at the data in okay. a different way. Yeah. Right. And with the worms, just how did you incorporate the worms? Were you using worms just for 
uh, one source depth or were you trying a different depths or be putting everything together in the same layer? Well, actually I had a, a 10 kilometer eight, six and two, but then I found that two actually helps to map uh, the distributions of had better correlation with the mineral deposits. And also because it's an orogenic gold deposit system, um, at two kilometer depths, it's where you probably have a lot of um, precipitation as well, like around like around a, a kilometer uh, depth. So that's how we got to using the magnetic worms, but they could be useful in porphyry systems too. So if you have a source that you know, you have an intrusive source, but you can model it, you would use the mag data to kind of get to the depth where the intrusive source would be. And that would be good for targeting uh, intrusions for porphyry um, systems. Okay, yeah. Thanks for all the details. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for the question. All right, just to follow up on the previous question, uh, Tom Belgrano has a, a question for you too. So is it common to use AI um, to guide what kind of data to collect? And for example, sensitivity analysis for iterative approaches? Not specifically. I think in terms of using AI, like create a prospectivity map and then figure out which areas are predicted as prospective, it is common to then go do field work and collect more data or um, maybe drilling or get more detailed geochemistry in that particular area to see if there's something different. Um, yeah, so I don't know if anybody has ever started with AI and then got on data and then run. You could do that too, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, that that would AI be guide you. <laughs> yeah, I would, I, that's a fair amount of, of like, for example, gold spots business business model. It would be to uh, rethink about the things that best help to explore for a deposit in a given area and then use the geophysics team to collect specifically those uh, data layers and uh, and then process them in a way like, like, for example, getting to the gravity worms and the first vertical yeah. derivative and tilt and everything like that. So I think I think it is. But then, of course, um, the difference, like for example, what you showed Francisca and you Chetan, you you guys used this amazing data set of public data, and uh, it's different to what you know, like the major mining companies say, for example, are doing, where they're out there collecting data, and now they have the teams in house to process that information in a in a AI prospectivity way. Yeah, and I think what you were talking about, how AI has taken its time into getting into becoming big as it is today, it's probably because of data availability. I wouldn't have been able to do the study if it wasn't because Canada has a database, you know, a publicly available data that I could just get and process and go through it as much as I can. And also the fact that we have public free libraries like Library in Scikit-Learn and uh, TensorFlow that were probably not as available in the past, I can't really say, but the fact that all these resources are available make it a lot easier to start incorporating AI as much as possible. And also that you can now there's so many courses available online where anyone can sort of learn these things themselves as well. Yeah, absolutely. It, it makes easier, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Just just uh, to wrap up the session, uh, I would like to each of the speaker try to to get in less than one minute what is the main challenge, uh, in your opinion, for machine learning and uh, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence for mineral exploration? So, Shetan, if you want to start, as you was the first speaker. Uh, I suppose, I mean, one thing could be the just open source data sets, I, I guess, because a lot of sort of different companies are, I guess, trying to compete with each other, is that there might not be as much sort of open sourcing of data sets as might be necessary for everyone to sort of advance towards answering the same questions. Um, I guess another challenge I always find with AI and exploration is um, just sort of sparsity of data and how you can have lots of data in some areas, but in other areas, you might just have no, no data representation at all. And I think that's another big challenge. I think, I mean, I, I think Sean and Francesco will probably be able to better comment on how to tackle those challenges. Yeah, I agree with Chetan. Uh, it's definitely data availability and data quality is probably some of the biggest challenges. You can have data, but um, maybe, you know, 
it doesn't cover an entire area as much as possible. And that, yeah, is data. If you don't have the best data, garbage in, garbage out, even with machine learning models. Uh, I would definitely echo those things for sure. I think, you know, if we looked at what we do have, we've got established AI frameworks and workflows, algorithms are set, great. Uh, do we have proofs of concept in geology that lead to discovery success? Yes, check, no problem. Uh, do we have a production solution for mining? No, not yet. Do we have people with the right skills and balance of skills between geology and, um, and computer science? Kinda, not really. We're in like major skills shortages in the geology world, which is like a hangover from the fact that, you know, people don't find mining interesting or attractive. And probably, you know, what's going to drive that huge change is when the world starts running out of metals, like at, you know, the nickel metals exchange in London and things like this. Uh, suddenly people are going to be really surprised and really anxious. And then there's going to be a flood of, of interest and investment and training in the subject matter. So that'll be the next thing that comes. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we will uh, finish uh, the session. If you have uh, more questions to the speakers, I believe you can contact them. Or if you want, you can contact us and we, we will try to put in contact with them. Uh, I would like to thank Chetan, Francisca and Sean. It was a great session. And I believe uh, this discussion is quite useful for a lot of people. Thank you, bye-bye. Yeah. See you next thank time. You. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.